Thank you so much for joining us. We have an, star, uh, an absolutely star lineup and very happy that we are um, being able to share all of this, their wisdom and their experience as part of the High Level Political Forum. All right. Well, welcome everybody. As I, as I said uh, before, it's uh, lovely to have you all. Uh, we are delighted to be part of the High Level Political Forum process with one of our webinars about um, discussing the important opportunity that we have right now to reset our relationship with the planet. Uh, my name is Patricia Zurita. I'm the Chief Executive of BirdLife International. Um, and we are going to, I'm going to walk you through a very quick presentation right now just to set the scene. But then I will leave most of the time uh, to our distinguished guests who will be sharing with us uh, their wisdom and vision about how, to we make, how can we make sure that we take advantage of um, this crisis as an opportunity to uh, define a much better system and a much better model uh, with the planet and with nature at its heart. Uh, for those of you who don't know about BirdLife, uh, we are a family of 115 organizations around the world. We're truly the power of many. We're the largest partnership for nature uh, of national conservation organizations. And we truly connect the world. Uh, we use birds as the perfect ambassador for nature, and they help us uh, pass the message that if we really want to protect nature, we have to do it together. Uh, we are the global authority for birds, uh, and the science, the science that we produce help us underpin all of our actions, but not only that, the star uh, publication that BirdLife has every four years of the sta state of the world birds really help us take the pulse of the, panel, of the planet and enable us to um, um, advise on a series of different policies and processes around the world. We have been part of the IPVS report, um, and you probably have seen this, um, but we had the, the report was not um, a very rosy picture of the status of the planet. Human action uh, is threatening more species with global extinction now than ever before. Nature across most of the globe has now significantly, has, has been significantly altered by multiple human drivers. Um, and climate change is a direct driver, driver of nature loss. So we are truly talking about these twin crises that are feeding into each other and that we need to tackle together. Um, now the interesting thing, and particularly now that we're talking about the high level political forum is um, that the nature actually underpins the achievement of all of the SDGs either directly for goals on water, climate, oceans, and biodiversity, or through more complex interactions for goals on poverty, hunger, health, cities, education, gender equality, uh, reduced inequalities, and peace. Um, we were just looking into some of the information that has been shared uh, um, as, a, as part of the high-level political forum. And uh, there's a statement that says that biodiversity underpins 14 of the 17 sustainable development goals. However, um, uh, this recent study showed that only 20% of the countries are analyzing and mentioning biodiversity as part of their national priorities uh, for sustainable development in their VNRs. Um, and when they are producing the, rep the progress, they're um, not reporting much on biodiversity and the, re the role that nature actually plays on the implementation of the SDGs. Uh, uh, just recently in the Measuring Progress Report of 2019, uh, UNEP reported uh, that there's okay progress in all in, uh, 11 environment-related SDGs, um, particularly in relation to policy, financial, and institutional processes. Um, there's mixed progress in terms of improving the access to environmental resources and reducing the impact, which, which is a little bit concerning. The problem is that there's either no data or no progress toward all 12 of the SDGs that, that have targets related to the state of the environment. So we are not making a lot of progress in terms of action. And we have to remember that to achieve the environmental dimension of the sustainable development agenda, we do need to scale up environmental action and improve environmental monitoring and analysis. Now, the WEF uh, has been producing the Global Risk Report over the last years, and it is not a surprise that in the 2020 report, climate action, uh, action failure, biodiversity loss, extreme weather, natural resource 
natural disasters and human-made environmental disasters are continuing to scale up in terms of the impact and the li likelihood in the, in the risk report. Um, and over the, um, over the last couple of years, you, we have seen um, an escalation. Uh, this graph shows the escalation of the environmental um, issues um, and risks uh, in terms of likelihood and impact um, that are having over the general risks. So now um, nature and environment are becoming uh, higher risks than econo the economy in general. Um, these are some of the facts of the, of the 2020 report. Um, but the reality is that we, despite of the fact that there is a clear connection between nature and economic stress and the, the well-being of nature and our well-being, um, half of the Fortune 500 companies are mentioned in biodiversity in their sustainability reports, but only five set specific measurable and time-bound targets. So we have to move from the rhetoric to the action uh, very clearly. Um, in the UN 75 Global Dialogue preliminary results uh, that had this amazing uh, survey, uh, we were able to see uh, as an independent source of information how important climate and environment have become um, as a trend uh, that will affect our future. This is how people are actually seeing um, what are the key things that are going to impact our future. And you can see uh, climate and environment is almost threefold uh, armed conflict and violence. That is the next one. And we're hearing it from the youth. Young people are demanding a safer future. And the, and the right to a healthy environment. And I'm delighted to have David Boyd uh, with us. Uh, we will be talking about the importance of making a healthy, safe, and sustainable environment and a, a, a right. Uh, you may have seen that Burlev has been um, uh, campaigning uh, to have a new right in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, now, we are at a time when we are realizing that the coming years are a vital period, as um, um, His Excellency Antonio Guterres said. Uh, it's now or never, really. And this was before COVID. Um, now we got hit uh, but by a pandemic that put the whole planet to a halt and is actually helping us hopefully realize that it is uh, important to build back better. Um, the priorities are clear. We need to reignite the economy, restore purchasing power, create new jobs, and prioritize the least well off. But we have to do it in a way that simultaneously tackles the climate change and biodiversity loss crisis. We cannot afford to build back uh, in, in as business as usual. So we truly believe at Bare Life that we have a unique opportunity to reset our relationship with the planet and put nature at the heart of a new, fair, and more sustainable development model. And we are campaigning hard to try to get a new right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that recognizes our human right to live in a healthy planet. Um, I am incredibly delighted to be welcoming our panel and we are going to have this in uh, enticing and incredible discussion about uh, how can we actually build back better. Um, so um, allow me to introduce uh, all of our panelists first, and then uh, we will go uh, from there. Um, I am uh, delighted and uh, thank you so much, Inger Anderson, for joining us. I know how busy you are right now. Um, Inger is the um, uh, Director General of the United Nations Environment Program. Um, uh, has been appointed uh, by the UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez in fe February 2019. Before that, um, Inger was the Director General of, of the IUCN, um, bringing passion for conservation and sustainable development with more than 30 years of experience. I had the pleasure of meeting Inger back in the days when she was at the World Bank. Um, Inger will be speaking to us about the lessons from COVID and the need to rebalance our relationship with nature to realize the 2030 agenda. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome also David Boyd, the UN Special Rapporteur on um, Human Rights and Environment. David was appointed as the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment uh, for a three-year term commencing August 2018. Uh, he is an Associate Professor of Law, Policy and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. Uh, his career has included serving as the Executive Director of EcoJustice, appearing before the Supreme Court of Canada, and working as a special advisor on sustainability for the Canadian Prime Minister, Paul Martin. 
He, was a, he has advised many governments on environmental, constitutional, and human rights policy and co-chaired Vancouver's effort to become the world's greenest city by 2020. He's a member of the World Commission on Environmental Law, an expert advisor for the UN's Harmony with Nature Initiative, and a member of ELO, uh, the Environmental Law Alliance worldwide, and I have to say a champion of the campaign of getting a new human right uh, for to a healthy environment. And David will be speaking about uh, his um, incredible uh, task of pushing this agenda forward and how can we uh, look, uh, why is it important to have a human right uh, to a healthy environment. Um, I am delighted to have Marisol Argueta de Varillas, uh, head of the Latin America World Economic Forum. Um, uh, she's the head of the executive committee at the WEF um, and a lawyer as, uh, and, a, and a career ambassador. Formerly, she was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of El Salvador uh, and other um, accolades include being a member of the Central American Leadership Initiative at the Aspen Institute on the advisory board of, uh, for Latin America program of the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington and on the Global Council of uh, CPEC in Argentina. Um, she's an author uh, on international affairs and has awards from Spain, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Panama, Italy, and the US. Marisol, it's a pleasure to have you and we will be talking with you about the great reset initiative uh, that the web has been promoting. Um, and hope, uh, she has a, um, a prior commitment, so she's been kind enough to give us a little bit of her time, but Marisol is gonna have to leave uh, 10, 10 before the hour. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Haig, a member of the Birdlife family, chief executive of uh, Forest and Bird. Um, Kevin joined Forest and Bird as the chief executive in 2016. Um, before this, he was um, the leadership. Um, she had lead, he had leadership roles in business and the government and community sectors. Uh, he served as a member of the parliament, parliament for eight years in New Zealand. Um, and was previously executive director of New Zealand AIDS Foundation and chief executive of the West Coast District Health Board. Um, Kevin has extensively been involved in various human rights issues and has a strong commitment to honoring the Te Titiri uh, Waitangi. Um, a previous member of the West Coast Taipotini um, Conservation Board, Kevin has also been involved in conservation advocacy and campaigning, and he is a dear uh, friend of the and member of the Birdlife family. Kevin will tell us a little bit about how civil society has an incredible role pushing for sustainability and health of environment at the heart of the New Zealand green recovery and, and the role of forest and bird working with the RDM administration. Um, and last, but certainly not least, uh, Pamela, mil gracias por acompañarnos. Uh, Pamela Castillo, Vice Minister of Natural Resources at the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. Um, she uh, holds a Master uh, in Environmental Security and Peace and has 18 years of experience in biodiversity management, conservation and sustainable use of natural resources. Currently, she holds the presidency of the National System of Conservation Areas, the SINAC, in Costa Rica, the National Fund for Forest Development, FONAFIFO, the National Council of Biodiversity Management of Costa Rica, CONAGEVIO, and the Environment Bank Foundation, the FUNBAM. She's also leading the development of the national policy and nature-based solutions in Costa Rica. Um, uh, Pam Pamela is going to be outlining uh, the, the need to see a green recovery and the role that the High Ambition Coalition uh, for Nature and People that is co-led by Costa Rica has in all this process. So first, again, a huge thanks uh, to all of you for making the time to join us. With that, Inger, can I give you the, the floor so you can share your remarks with us, please? Thank you so much, Patricia, and let me thank BirdLife and my fellow panelists for uh, having this opportunity to talk. Well done, BirdLife, to get an event at HLPF. And it's nice to see all my ex-colleagues from BirdLife uh, here, as well as uh, finally to see David. Uh, we keep exchanging notes, but we have not yet had the opportunity to meet in person. Um, just yesterday, we released um, a new report that speaks to uh, zoonosis, COVID-19, and uh, the, the environment and how we're going to deal with this. And so it's very fitting that it comes right on the, that this event comes right on the heel on it. How is it going to, how are we going to reset, as we will hear from Marisol, our relationship with the planet? 
And so we, in this report that we have released uh, together with Ilri, we, speaks about, we speak about the imperatives of One Health. We speak about the fact that we have for long just considered human health, which is very important, uh, but we've considered that. And then there was this other health called veterinary health, uh, which somewhat we considered. And then there was this other health that nobody really considered, which is planetary health. How is that planet doing? And these three things we need to think about together because for too long we fragmented, illegally trade, decimated, encroached upon, or paved over, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that last piece, piece of the health puzzle. And when we do that, clearly uh, we have seen that there are consequences. Um, we have, we are about what we went. We were 1.6 billion people in 1900. Today we are 7.8. Now that's a fine thing, um, but we've also increased our meat production and consumption, therefore by 260 percent over the last 50 years. We have increased 90 percent our milk production, 340 percent our eggs production. So all of this takes up part of the agricultural space because meanwhile we're wasting about one fifth of the uh, if, if we're wasting a huge amount of food if food were a country it would be the fifth largest emitter of co2 food waste that is so we really have some rethinking to do we have a hundred million people who go to bed hungry we need to address that uh, we need to address uh, adequacy in diets and, and nutrition, for sure. But we need to do that in a way that is nature positive. And we need to now understand that what we have been doing to our planet so far is not uh, sustainable. I won't go into IPES and all of these numbers, which we have uh, repeated ad nauseum in all these panels. We all know um, that we put, pushed nature to its very edge and that it is simply not sustainable. And so we speak to the fact that at this point, there are sort of um, in there's seven key drivers that have caused us to get to where we are. We need to understand that 60% of infectious diseases are in fact zoonosis. 75% of new infectious diseases are zoonotic in nature. And we should not have been surprised about COVID-19 because we have been saying it, we meaning many of those folks who work on biodiversity, understand zoonosis and understand how we humans have gotten closer and closer to animals, be it through our domestication or be it through trade or encroachment in nature spaces. And there we have clearly um, played with, 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 with nature in a way that has caused ever increasing amount of zoonosis to occur. So, we need to talk about um, our, how we do our agriculture, including how, uh, how we do animal husbandry uh, and that intensification. We need to talk about uh, exploitation of wildlife, unsustainable use of natural resources, extractive industries, increased travel and transportation, and how we deal with that, uh, food supply chains and climate change. Because with climate change, we do understand that there are species shifts, and accordingly we see uh, a greater pathogen spread because the natural balance is upset by some of these species shifts. So all of this then is in building back better, and I'm aware I have just a minute left now. Um, so in building back better, we need to be mindful that these stimulus packages are coming in now in the trillions. So by the way, let it not be said that we can't get 100 million for climate finance, uh, 100 uh, billion, uh, for climate finance by 2020 because we found trillions now so end of bracket but now so uh, with these trillions we need to understand that they tend to come in waves and we need to be understanding of that first wave will be fiscal in nature and cannot be made green so let's not pretend and let's just accept that this is about cutting checks to get money in people's pockets people who've been laid off, who need food packages, et cetera. And that's a fine and good thing. And may states do that. In Kenya, for example, the government rolled out tax decreases, VAT drops, things like that, to make life a little better. So the environment movement, get out of that space, leave that space, because that is about getting money in people's pockets right now, protecting the most vulnerable. But the second wave is often about... Um, ready-made projects with shovel-ready shovel ready projects, things that often are about repairing, build, uh, repairing, mending, fixing, 
and planting. Now look what Pakistan did. They, for example, put some $50 million into tree planting. That's money in people's pockets. It's job generation, as is fixing potholes and painting schools. And we like that because it's good for the community. The third wave is where we need to focus. That third wave is generally hard infrastructure to drive the economy, to lift, lift economic gears. And that's a good thing. That's where the big monies are being planned now, but you will only see them 10 to 18 months from now. And that's where we need to focus. It needs to be green when it's infrastructure. If it's energy, we know where it needs to go. I don't need to say it, it's obviously renewable. And a lot of job generation can in fact also be done through ensuring a retrofitting of buildings and things of this nature, bicycle ways. And there are good examples across the world from during this lockdown where people were moving in different ways on their bicycles, not on public transport, where the streets were closed down. So we've learned a lot. And I think what people have seen, and this will be my last point, um, Patricia, is whilst this lockdown is completely terrible from a human perspective, uh, in that 1.9 billion children are out of school and on and on, and the, and the poverty that this has done, the reversal of our winning on the SDGs is happening. But we have seen that if we put our shoulders to the wheel, that it is actually possible, not by locking down, but that we can in very short time clean up those dirty skies, ensure that that 7 million people who die prematurely from uh, air pollution do not, if we invest in green and clean. And so I'm particularly pleased that David is on this panel because here, this whole idea of looking at rights um, and it's time to think about rights to a healthy environment. And you will take us into a deeper discussion on this, but we know that there are about what some 150 countries where at the national level, national level, there is enshrined in national legislation, a rights on environmental dimensions. Now let's talk about what that looks like at the international level. And Michelle Bachelet, my colleague recently said, and you quoted her David in a tweet, and I retweeted you, uh, where, you uh, where she said, it is time for global recognition of the human right to a healthy environment, recognition that can lead to stronger policies at all levels to protect our planet and our children. There's nothing more powerful than that. So with that, let me stop and hand it back over to you, Patricia. Thank you so much, Inger. That was absolutely fantastic. And yes, we do need to do green and clean. And we also have to think how do we factor ecosystem restoration in all of that mix and change in the way that we're producing our food. Um, and you teed it up fantastically well. Uh, our next speaker is David Boyd. David, tell us more about the right to a healthy environment. Well, muchas gracias, Patricia, and thank you to BirdLife International for this event. And thank you really to this beautiful blue-green planet that we're all so fortunate to call home. You know, Earth is the only planet in the universe that's known to support life, and yet we're not treating this home with the respect that it deserves. COVID-19 is just the latest illustration of that. We're also facing a global climate emergency, the biodiversity crisis, and let's not forget, pervasive toxic pollution that kills more than 10 times as many people every year as COVID-19 has killed so far. So this is why over the past year or so, we've heard unprecedented messages from the world's scientific community, the IPCC, IPBES, the World Health Organization, UN Environment, all saying the same thing, which is that we need rapid, systemic, and transformative changes in order to address these interconnected global crises. And if we look back over the past two centuries, history tells us that one of the most powerful ways that we can transform society is through human rights. The abolitionists championed freedom and equality for slaves. The women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement, indigenous peoples, LGBTQ plus peoples. All of these movements have harnessed the power of human rights to make changes that at the time seemed daunting or even impossible. So clearly human rights are not a magic wand that we can just wave and make our problems simply disappear but the evidence of their power is irrefutable. And that's why I'm so passionate about the need for global recognition of the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. What could be more fundamental for human health, well-being, and dignity? What could be more timely in light of the global environmental crisis? 
And yet you'll find no mention of this right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the two main global treaties, the International Covenant on Civil, Civil and Political Rights or the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. When these treaties were drafted, people did not make the connection between human rights and the environment. And to this day, the United Nations has never recognized this right. But as Inger mentioned, the right to a healthy environment has made progress at the regional and national level over the past 50 years. It's recognized in regional human rights treaties, constitutions, court decisions, and environmental laws. And in total, more than 80% of UN member states recognize this fundamental human right. It includes access to information, public participation, and access to justice, and also clean air, a safe climate, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, clean air and adequate sanitation, healthy and sustainably produced food, and non-toxic environments where people can live, work, study, and play. But here's the really good news about the right, right to a healthy environment. It makes a difference. It sparks stronger environmental laws, improved implementation and enforcement of those laws, and greater public participation. Most importantly though, research shows that states where this right is recognized reduce air pollution more quickly, reduce greenhouse gases more quickly, and gain access for people to safe drinking water more rapidly. In other words, the right to a healthy environment improves people's lives by protecting human health and by protecting ecosystem health. Time is short, but let me give you two quick examples. Costa Rica, and we're so fortunate to have the vice minister with us today, Costa Rica added the right to a healthy environment to its constitution in 1994. And since that time has really become one of the world's global environmental leaders. 25% of Costa Rica is in national parks. 98% of their electricity comes from renewables. They prohibit offshore oil and gas development and open pit mining, but Costa Rica is fantastic. And France added this right to their constitution in 2005, and since then has done great things, including the first country to ban fracking for oil and gas, the first country to ban all uses of the neonicotinoid pesticides that are harming bees and more. So my friends, it is time for the United Nations to pass a resolution recognizing this fundamental right. This would spur more states to recognize this right, push all states to accelerate actions to implement it, and it would empower and validate the tremendous work of environmental human rights defenders who we all know are, are struggling around the world. So as a result, I'm working in my UN role with civil society and supportive states at the Human Rights Council in Geneva and the General Assembly in New York to achieve such a resolution as soon as possible. And I'm so grateful that BirdLife International is joining this effort. I believe that every person, no matter where they live, no matter whether they're rich or poor, no matter the color of their skin, everyone, has the basic human right to live in a healthy environment. And if we recognize and implement this right, it could be one of the most important human rights of the 21st century. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing my fellow panelists. Thank you so much, David, for your passion, for your vision, for your, for your force behind all of this. I cannot agree more. And also, it's not only about how this uh, right uh, just creates all of this fantastic impact. It also raises the visibility of the role that nature plays. And I think that's one of the key things that is going to help spearhead all of these changes. Um, thank you so much. Um, I would like to uh, give the floor to Marisol. Marisol, we are hearing um, incredible news uh, from the web about the great reset. What can you tell us? Thank you very much, Patricia, for this invitation and for your work, wonderful work and a brilliant team at BirdLife International. I'd also like to acknowledge my friend Miguel Araujo, who introduced that his, he was the first minister of the environment of my home country, El Salvador, and he has truly been an inspiring and decisive green force in our region. And who now leads Alba Natura's Green Decade Initiative in Central America and in the southern and southeastern states of Mexico, what we call Mesoamerica. I would like, to, it would not be possible to begin this conversation without acknowledging the extraordinary times that we're living in. The COVID-19 crisis has confronted us with unprecedented challenges, not only in terms of preser preserving lives and health, which are a priority, but also with multifaceted social and economic disruptions at a time when we were approaching our planet's limits. The global defy is fundamentally changing the world as we have known, and it's putting leaders from all sectors 
a great crossroads, managing short-term pressures against medium and long-term uncertainties. If these are left unaddressed, this crisis will deepen and leave the world in a less sustainable, a less equal, and more fragile situation. Yet in parallel to the unprecedented challenge, there is also an extraordinary opportunity to rapidly accelerate efforts to improve the state of the world. As we currently see, there is a clear need to recreate trust and to promote further global public-private collaboration with the objective of shaping the post-COVID-19 era. In that context, and as we have learned important lessons in the past few months, the World Economic Forum has moved swiftly to adapt and develop with its partners, that includes the UN Secretary General and many prominent leaders from civil society, academia, experts, and governments into this new initiative. A we have, a, from our perspective, as the International Organization for Public-Private Collaboration, we have based our strategic thinking based on three critical facts. The first one is recognizing the unprecedented new global context. The second is to acknowledge an extraordinary opportunity for a reset. And third, the demand for multi-stakeholders leadership decisive and forward-looking action. Our founder and executive chairman, Professor Klaus Schwab, has made a call for the urgent need that all stakeholders may cooperate simultaneously in managing the consequences of this crisis while working together to shape a new revitalized system that is more cohesive, more sustainable, and more resilient. We're calling this initiative the Great Reset. As we enter a unique window of opportunity, to shape the recovery. It will provide a global platform to support the coordination and collaboration needed to help determine the future state of global relations, the direction of national economies, the priorities of societies, the nature of business models, and the management of our global commons. But most of all, to jointly address the gaps and deficiencies that old models had not managed to resolve. It is thus of extreme importance that we do not go back to the old normal, but that we really envision innovative ways to ensure a sustainable and inclusive future. The Great Reset Agenda seeks for a global recovery, not only to address clear and present challenges, but rather that we usher strategic long-term transformations globally. The Great Reset Initiative has three main components. The first one is to steer the global economy toward fairer outcomes. Governments have a powerful incentive to create the conditions for a stakeholder's economy, as it was the theme of our past annual meeting at Davos, and to pursue long overdue reforms to promote more sustainable and equitable outcomes, including, for example, the right to a clean environment, as Anger and David shared earlier, uh, but also to review the, some wealth and environmental taxes, in, incentives, subsidies, and other policies in a very practical way. And some, other, some of our foreign partners have proposed that development bank loans, for example, decisively prioritize projects with environmental sustainability and social inclusion objectives. Other partners have suggested that the, as the European Great Deal, the European Green Deal is one such transformational effort, G20 economies that plan to inject $8 trillion in stimulus packages, as Inger mentioned also earlier, there should be accompanied by requirements to put in place sustainable practices. The second component is to ensure that investments advance toward shared goals, including equity and sustainability. For example, to build green urban infrastructure, finding a balance between our growing population and the smart and responsible management of our resources, and to create the incentives to comply and improve it, their track record on ESG, ESGD metrics. 
This stands for environmental, social, governance, and data stewardship. To this end, the forum proposed the DAO's manifesto in January of this year. Now, from a private sector's perspective, industries are realizing that there will be radical shifts and that this is a critical moment for transformation. As it is for governments and for civil society, which are so well represented here, there is also a unique opportunity for companies to reposition and to build a better future. Society is expecting companies to be protagonists in this recovery while being socially responsible, inclusive, and environmentally sustainable. As new consumption patterns have emerged, production and supply processes are evolving, and it is important that large companies help and support transformation towards sustainable models throughout their value chain. To cope with the complexities around technology and innovation, the works for skills, government policies, infrastructure, and environmental concerns. And the third priority of the Great Reset Agenda is to harness the innovations of the fourth industrial revolution to support the public good. The Great Reset will also be the theme of our annual meeting, and it will be unlike any other uh, previous Davos meeting. It will be a unique twin summit, both in person and virtual, connecting key global government and business leaders in Davos with a global multi-stakeholder network in 400 cities around the world for a forward-oriented dialogue driven by the younger generation. The challenge we face today to send national borders, industries and sectors of society, and to invoke Winston Churchill's famous quote in today's meeting context, never waste a good crisis. Tragedy, tragedy should not be the one legacy of this global defy, but the opportunity in our generation, not to build back, but to build forward together responsibly, to reflect and reset our world, to strengthen our communities and create a more resilient, equitable, prosperous, and environmentally sustainable future. Let's count on each other. And thank you very much again for this invitation. It's been such a great pleasure to share with other panelists and to meet you today, Patrice. Thank you so much, Marisol. No, and uh, absolutely, let's make the legacy of this terrible crisis be the opportunity of building back better. Um, it is my immense pleasure to introduce uh, my dear friend, Kevin Haig, uh, Chief Executive of Forest and Bird. Kevin, you guys have been working tirelessly with the RDM administration, making sure that we can get this uh, green recovery in practice in New Zealand. What can you tell us? Well, kia ora tato and, and kia ora Patricia. Uh, kia ora tato is, in our indigenous language, a way of saying uh, wishing wellness and well-being to all of us. Um, um, it's it's very early in the morning here in, in New Zealand, and this is a very dark room, so I'm going to sh uh, share my screen. Forest and Bird is the Royal Forest and Bird Protection Society of New Zealand, um, and our mission is to protect and restore nature in Aotearoa, which is the indigenous name uh, for New Zealand. And as Patricia says, we've been working uh, pretty closely with, with our government, the Ardern government. Um, the environment minister in that government, David Parker, is very fond of quoting Herman Daly, and you will have seen this quote before, I'm sure. Um, we have used this as a platform to be saying, we need to change the relationship between the economy and the environment. Um, so rather than the input of raw materials into the economy or the waste disposal from the economy, the environmental goals should actually, be, should ha actually have primacy our economy should serve our environmental goals and our social goals. Uh, and in our, uh, our, our annual budget last year, uh, the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, who you'll see on the left-hand side, made a bit of a splash on the world stage by saying our budget's going to aim for more than just maximising GDP. And in particular, our government has adopted a budget that has four capitals, natural capital, social capital, human capital and financial capital. And all government measures need to try and maximize those capitals. 
So, so we move from a maximizing GDP approach to a, a well-being framework um, that actually has more of a balanced scorecard. Um, and that's important because the economy has enormous momentum. And so under ordinary circumstances, it's pretty hard to change its, its, its direction. So if we wanted to do something else, it requires an awful lot of effort under normal circumstances. But right now we have the situation with COVID where the economy is like the ship, but kind of dead in the water. Um, and it's gonna take as much effort to get it going back up to speed in the old uh, damaging direction that it was going as it would to actually set it into a new direction. And so that's what we're trying to achieve. So we've worked with government to, um, to acknowledge the impacts on the economy from the pandemic um, and to figure out ways that we could move forward. We put together a proposal to government for how it could spend um, uh, around a billion dollars on things that actually would maximize that human capital um, or in, in perhaps David's language, um, recognizing uh, social uh, and economic rights, um, uh, but also be restorative for the environment. And government in its budget this year, in fact, announced a package that reflected almost, almost one for one the proposal that we had put to them, $1.3 billion, which in New Zealand terms is an enormous sum of money. Um, we, are, um, we are now uh, working with that. So 1.1 is specifically for this program called Jobs for Nature. There's another um, $200 uh, million for, for an ancillary program. Um, so we're working with them now on implementation because New Zealand is in the fortunate position of having eliminated COVID. So we are into our recovery phase right now. So here's a big program that reflects exactly the kind of joined up thinking that has our economy serving our environmental and social goals. Um, here's what we're doing next. And I share this slide because just today, um, a second really big and important initiative has occurred in New Zealand. And that is the government has announced a new strategy for transformation of our primary industry. So agriculture, fishing and forestry um, are to be transformed over the next several years to have a restorative relationship with the environment. And those are, those are the industries that until now have been the industries that have created the greatest habitat loss. And this process of just transition has certainly the environment at its heart but it also has the recognition of human rights associated with that too. And exactly the way that say Naomi Klein has, has set out or, or that bird life is campaigning for with, with, with our new campaign. Um, it's important. We're one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. We're also uh, the country in the world with the highest proportion of our endemic species at risk of or threatened with extinction. We have to get this right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's lovely to hear that actually something is happening on the ground. Uh, and that, um, Certainly, New Zealand is uh, leading the way. Um, to close the panel, I would like to invite uh, Pamela uh, to talk about your perspective from Costa Rica, not only in terms of the um, green recovery uh, in your country, but also the role that you guys have been playing at the High Ambition Coalition um, and the importance that all of these states have now that we're going to be setting the 2030 um, and the post-2020 agenda. Thank you, Patricia, and all the panelists for this great introduction and discussion. Uh, for Costa Rica, it seems we, we, we always not been green, as, as you said at, at the beginning and someone said. Uh, we realized 30 years ago that we need to recover our natural capital to be able to give uh, well-being to our populations. So um, we take, a, a, I think, the great decisions that make that possible, and that that decisions make us believe 
that the new reset or the reset or the or rebuilding forward as Marisol said, not not building back. It's based on when it will be successful if we put nature at the front and at the center of the economic development of the world. And this means that Costa Rica 30 years ago invest in recovering our forest coverage. As David said, we, uh, we have the 25% of our territory under protected area, but we have 3% of our oceans too. We are 10 times bigger in oceans, so we have uh, uh, a huge depth that we need to protect our oceans, our seas. And we have the 52% of our territory under a forest coverage. How we do that? If only 27% is, 25% uh, is in protected areas. We recognize that the custodians of our forests are indigenous territories, but small producers too. So we build an agro-environmental agenda to recover these lands. And in that sense, we create environmental payment services that now is one of our big tools to go forward and to create incentive so we can pay for an integrated payment for all the services natural resources have in a farm. And why is this? We have the 47% of land use is destined to agriculture. So agriculture, as all the panelists said there, is the biggest ally to biodiversity and nature. If we can build together an agenda and a sustainable agenda, we'll give health and we'll create, and we believe it is possible to create new economic cycles that give to this agenda a, a value added because our products that have a positive impact, not only in nature, it's giving positive impact in nature and health, human health. So in that sense, um, I'm very happy to share with you too, that uh, as David uh, remarks, we have the constitutional right to health environment since 94, but recently, just the past 5th of June, we, um, have as a constitutional right the access to clean water to everyone in Costa Rica. So we are stronger believe, believers that we have to have a proclamation, a global proclamation that gives the environment the space that it should be recognized. As David say, we need a healthy home. Everyone wants a healthy home. So that means that we need, for now to be forward, we need ambitious goals as a global scale. In that sense, that's why Costa Rica is colluding with France, the government of France, the High Ambition Coalition, because we, we see it, the results in our country of investing and recovering nature. So we believe that as a global scale, we need, and we have the opportunity right now that we are negotiating the framework post-2020 to go as an ambitious goal that is not amb is ambitious because of what the world is said now, but is the least that chance that we have to protect our nature that is protecting the 30 plus percent of terrestrial ecosystems and the 30 percent of the ocean ecosystems. If you see on an economic level, it, is, it will be more costly to lose our ecosystems than protecting them. So we, we don't have the chance as a planet to lose our last chance to protect our ecosystems. And in this sense, if you um, review the different amounts that we should be investing as a planet to, to accomplish the Aichi target, we're supposed to be invested 100, uh, 140 billion billions per year. And we are only investing 80 billion um, per year right now. And from that 80, uh, 80 billion that we are investing now, only the 80% uh, 80 of that is investing 
by national budgets. The rest is 10% of cooperation, uh, multilateral cooperation, and 10% of private sector. So, to accomplish the 30 by 30 of, uh, of protecting our terrestrial and ocean ecosystems, we need to be inclusive. And this means we have to be transformative. We need everyone on board, government, private sector, social society, because it's one planet, it's one, one home, and as uh, Inger said, it's one health. So there is no way to, to, to have, uh, for not to be optimist, because it's, it's kind of to be survival here. <laughs> and it's a good business too. So I, uh, we strongly believe that the 30 by 30 is possible with the commitment of every country. We have the opportunity to rebuild economy now by having nature at the front and at the center. And as Costa Rica, we have the example that we invest in nature-based solutions 30 years ago. And now we are seeing the results of being able to quantify what our economy have gained and our development have gained by investing in nature-based solutions. And to see that it's possible to create an increased quality of life to our population by giving a healthy environment. So uh, I will stop here because we have a lot of time to discuss on questions and, and answers. So I will stop here just by saying again to build forward because I love that from what is all. And uh, we need to have nature at the center and at the front. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you so much. It was lovely to hear your voice uh, from Costa Rica and the leadership that you guys have had. All right, so let me turn it out to the panel now. Um, there are a bunch of questions coming up from the audience and I do have to throw one on my own as well. Um, so we are all talking about how to make this happen, how we're talking about um, needs to happen. We are talking about, uh, we, have, we need transformation, we need a new model, we need inclusivity, we need to see the value and the, and the business and economic economic um, return that nature can actually provide. But how do we make it happen? How do we create those uh, incentives? Marisol, you were mentioning uh, that the, the Great Reset is talking about looking at uh, the unique opportunity for companies um, to be uh, investing in their production and supply chains uh, and looking into shared goals and incentives and making sure that we are properly reporting on ESG. Let me start with you because I know that you have to leave soon. Um, how, how do we turn this around? How do we make it a reality? How do we make those incentives really come in? How do we take away those perverse incentives that have been destroying our planet? This is a very important undertaking. And what the World Economic Forum is highlighting is that we have now a unique opportunity to broaden this awareness that we have and now created about how fragile our world is. But it is important to invite different stakeholders to engage in this great reset agenda. I'm a firm believer of the multi-stakeholder approach and the driving force that the younger generation would encourage us to follow. If consumption patterns are being modified because of current circumstances, and this should also create not only uh, an incentive that is, as David and others have mentioned, which are extremely important to set out rights, and uh, as Costa Rica has advanced constitutional rights, uh, and I'm a great believer of, of those efforts, but there's also very practical forces in market that are changing and that should be encouraging businesses, for example, to change the production models. And for the larger companies, there should be a, an important responsibility also to help smaller businesses, medium, small, and micro businesses in assisting them and encouraging them and creating incentives for them 
to also move towards sustainable models. Uh, I think this is, this is a very important approach. And I really congratulate David, and I'm encouraged by Pamela in Costa Rica. We should all really move forward in that, in that path. I, we're so close, Pamela, I'm here in El Salvador today, but it feels so far when I listen about the path that you have been able to drive forward and hope that through our cooperation bilaterally and multilateral, Costa Rica is able to lead that way. Thank you so much, Marisol. I know that you have to run and sorry for making you late, but thank you for sharing your wisdom and we're looking forward to seeing you soon before the WEF uh, has the great reset. Thanks again. We have a great opportunity ahead and look forward to partnering with all these extraordinary people that I have the privilege to share this partner with, this panel with. Thank you, Marisol. All right, so let me take it. Let me take it to you guys at the national level, Kevin and Pamela. Um, Pamela, you guys have led this 30 years ago, uh, changing uh, the incentives for nature-based solutions. Um, how, what is your recommendation for the other countries? How do you position it? How do you? And 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 I will bring it that to Kevin as well, because you are working now with the national government in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand is clearly showing leadership. How, how can we convince the rest? I mean, you heard it from Marisol, El Salvador está queladito. <laughs> how do we make them turn it around? Okay, I think that uh, from our experience, how we done was uh, creating economic incentive. When you understand the nature, give a lot of services, but you have to quantify and value them as, a, a, as part of the whole national economic development is a really key. So having the numbers of how much nature um, uh, aporta, how is that, uh, contribute to development uh, is really a key issue to, to, to come with a business case from, from other sectors. And in that sense, when you, when you look uh, the, how much you gain from nature, when you invest in nature, because as a national level, you have to invest less because you are more resilient. So when you have climate change effects and you have nature um, events, you have more resilient ecosystems. So in that sense, it protects and it will have less investment at a national level on these topics. But at the same time, it gives you an added value and you, you, when you have nature at the center of, of production, you need less resources because you have. So that an example for this is so creating incentive, incentive, economic incentives is really a key. The second one is value the services that, that nature contribute at a national level in development. But then you see the effects on the ground and understanding the reality of the ones who have the opportunity to care of nature and when they have to decide. If I, um, when, when you go to the round and, and a small produce, producer or medium producer, that that's what Costa Rica is about. We don't have land, huge land owners. We have medium and small uh, producers. So you have to understand when they say to you, I need to make a decision I have cattle, so I can I can uh, I can sell if, if one of my kids gets sick, or how 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 can you uh, compensate the investment of planting trees and waiting 12 years so as to have access to that resource? And in that sense, what that's why incentives are really important, good incentives. And I would like to just to make a. a what we have moved forward on this, this COVID situation and to be inclusive, we create um, a program that is called uh, More Woman, More Nature, understanding the huge gap of gender gap that uh, women doesn't have the nature of land, so they have left out of technical assistance or our environmental payment services. In that sense, on this COVID situation and to promote nature-based solutions, understanding that most of them are on women's hands, we launch microcredits to uh, women 
without having that land tenure as a guarantee to access, to, to access these credits. And we launch our environmental payment services for women. That means getting an, an extra value of the uh, request from women. And in this sense, they can scale on that long list that we have without giving them a special treat. And we as a country are truly believed that new eco uh, economic cycles could be done with nature and conservation. And in this sense, we are working with the Presidency Ministry and Environmental Ministry in what we call Costa Rica Man Natura or Costa Rica Plus Nature, that will be our first national policy of nature-based solutions as a national umbrella policy. And this will be going down as, at, as the territorial development strategy of reactivation of economy. And this sense, every sector of, the, of our government will be investing in nature-based solutions. So mainstreaming, that's the second, and the third key is mainstreaming nature or biodiversity in the, in, in the, in the national agenda. We need to have nature at the front and at the center and to mainstream, that is the way that we, we found out that we have to just to consolidate and capitalize what, what, what we have been done for the 30 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pamela. And, and there's no question that you guys have been a leader on this and it's fabulous to see. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the inclusion element. I love that. I love to hear this payment for women. I love to hear uh, more women for nature. Um, Kevin, let me let me go to you one second before we move into the right conversation. Um, it's interesting to see this new restoring um, uh, initiative of the administration. How do you, if they are actually tackling all of the key productive product, production sectors of the country, how are they making sure that we are, you know, as, as Pamela was saying, how are we putting all the right incentives in place and taking taking care of the perverse incentives. Uh, how is that happening in practice? Well, they just announced it today. So, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to work. But uh, I mean, I think the thing that I would add to what, what Pamela has just said is, is that that's been very important for us and is, um, I think, the most significant factor in driving the change that we need. Um, has been making emotional connections. So um, the, uh, our, our, our core message has been New Zealanders love nature and want to protect it. And using, using that basic emotional connection of love uh, has made an enormous difference. Uh, it has enabled us to make environmental protection and conservation uh, issues at our general election and all of our political parties have had to compete with the best policies for for achieving that kind of protection and that's 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 really new in our country we you know we 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 worked a long time to try and achieve that and we managed to do it at the last election that has created the platform for the, for that conversation about that balanced scorecard approach to 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 the government's program that actually puts environment and social goals ahead of, or at least at the same level as uh, economic goals. Um, and so we're in an environment now, of course, where uh, I, th I think it was uh, Inga in, on the panel earlier was talking about globally trillions of, of, of dollars being, being um, sunk into, uh, into recovery efforts. It's not quite trillions of dollars in New Zealand, but uh, huge amounts of money are being sunk into into recovery uh, um, recovery efforts. And in that environment, um, actually using the state's money um, to ensure that the right outcomes come out of industry now seems commonplace and an obvious thing to do. Whereas uh, six months ago, it, it would have seemed um, essentially impossible. So, you know, that, that emotional connection, I think, is, is the one thing that I would add to what Pamela has said. Thank you, Kevin. 
So that emotional connection and that love for our nature and our planet actually dives exact, right exactly at the element of elevating this right for the healthy planet to the highest possible pedestal, the, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and, and David, I, I saw a question from the public saying, it, aren't the, the perverse incentives that we have right now rolling out all of this economic movement that we have seen infringing on human rights as well? Cannot that be also one hook to make, make things change? How, how do you see that connection between inclusivity, the green recovery, our plea for a human right for a healthy environment? Yeah, great question. And I do have to just say, I want to start by saying, I just love listening to Pamela and Kevin about the things that are happening in Costa Rica and New Zealand. So powerful, so positive, so encouraging. Um, you know, these perverse incentives, I mean, it's kind of interesting because uh, somebody mentioned earlier on the panel that we spend about $80 billion a year in protecting biodiversity globally. But the, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development just published a, a report last year which produced that $80 billion figure, they also produced a figure which was how much do we spend on subsidies that damage nature? And that figure is 500, over $500 billion a year. So really, if we're looking for a pot of money that we could use to actually restore and rebuild nature, it's right there. Let's take the perverse subsidies away and let's put it back into ecological restoration. And the thing that's powerful about a rights-based approach, about talking about the right to a healthy environment, is that you know, we have all of these uh, international environmental agreements like the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands of International Importance. But the problem with these, which they sound great on paper, but they have no enforcement mechanisms. And what human rights brings to the table is accountability and enforcement so that people can actually say, we have the right to a healthy environment and what you're doing is violating that right. I can give you examples from all over the world, but just to name a few, uh, a couple of years ago, a group of children in Mexico, based on their constitutional right to a healthy environment in Article 4 of the Mexican Constitution said, this tourism project that's proposed in our community, which will require cutting down mangrove forests, that's a violation of our constitutional right. The Supreme Court of Mexico said, hey, kids, you are absolutely right. This violates your right. And this hun multi hundreds of millions of dollar project cannot go ahead. In Colombia, same kind of thing. A group of children and youth, based on their constitutional right to a healthy environment, filed a lawsuit against the government saying that deforestation in the Amazon was a violation of their fundamental right to a healthy environment. The Supreme Court of Colombia vindicated that challenge and ordered the government to come up with a plan by sitting down with children and scientists to end deforestation in the Colombian portion of the Amazon. In places like Argentina and Chile, People have used their constitutional right to a healthy environment to force governments to clean up the most polluted and contaminated places in those countries. The Riachuelo River Basin in Buenos Aires, Puchin, the Quintero Puchincavi uh, area in Chile. And so what we're seeing is that by recognizing this fundamental human right to live in a healthy environment, people can actually take that right and force governments to do what is right for people for, for the planet and for ecosystem health. And that's why I'm so excited about the prospect of this. So let me follow up with that. I mean, it's like we are perfectly tied up here, except that this is actually a question coming from the floor. Um, so there's a, there's a question from the youth effort saying, often it seems like the discourse of the, at the UN level is separate from everyday action. And youth has played this a bit of a translator role uh, between these two dimensions. However, we still uh, lack supporters and voices inside our, our governments. How can the international community establish greater commitments and spaces with youth grassroots efforts to localize action and protect nature? And I would add, elevate that from the grassroots and local efforts to the international level. Um, David, let me, let me go with you first now. Okay, very quickly, this is a key part of my work as a special rapporteur right from the very beginning has been engaging with youth. And I'm really, really delighted to be working with a, a, the Children's Environmental Rights Initiative on a series of global consultations where we get together and we sit down with really these amazing youth and their, their knowledge of the environment, their passion for the environment, their, art, their eloquence is amazing. And my job as a special rapporteur is to listen to their voices and then use my position to amplify that. So for example, last week, the Human Rights Council in Geneva held its annual day of discussion on children's rights. 
And the topic for the focus was children's rights and the environment. And for the first time ever, we actually had youth participating in panels, a young woman from Colombia, a young, a young person from Sierra Leone. And to have children's voices right there directly in front of the, the member states of the Human Rights Council, very powerful. When I was in Madrid at the Conference of Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change last December, I sat on four or five panels with some of the most amazing young people I've ever met in my life. So I think we're making progress in, in listening to children's voices, in listening to youth voices. The next step is to actually take what they're saying and act upon it. And one of the things they're calling for is action, action, action. Agreed. Um, Pamela, how do you see that going in Costa Rica? You guys are moving into uh, Costa Rica Mas Natura. Uh, how is that incorporating the voice of the, of the youth? Yes, when I heard David, uh, I'm really excited uh, of one of our Bicentenario campaign. You know, uh, Costa Rica is getting 200 older of, of, uh, of being a republic, a democratic republic. So we designed uh, a campaign at the national level, but international, it will be possible too. That is called, I have a powerful name, I love it. Just like Costa Rica Manatura. It contributes, but it's a campaign on how, how to, to engage youth, kids, and all. Uh, and it's called the, the Footprint for the Future. La Huella del Futuro. And it's a really, powerful and emotional as Kevin said um, name because if you understand it the footprints is always on the past but there is one footprint that you actually could transcend on the future and it's planting a tree so um, you know that in our decarbonization plan we have uh, the national commitment to uh, restore 4,000 uh, for 400,000 hectares. So it's been increasing from that 52% of our forest coverage to the 60%. So this campaign will allow every person that lives in Costa Rica or out of Costa Rica to adopt a tree to, to, to be able to contribute to this national goal. And when we, um, when we thought of this campaign to adopt a tree, what we actually dream is that every kid or, or every person in Costa Rica, living in Costa Rica, or an enterprise with, uh, with activities in Costa Rica, everyone, each of the, of, 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 of the people that live in Costa Rica, will have in the future a group of trees that is being taken care by them. And it means that when you adopt a tree, you are adopting the scholarship <laughs> of this tree. That means that it's not only planting the tree, it's actually you are paying for the maintenance of this tree by minimum three years or maximum five years. That is how much it takes to a tree to be adult and be able to survive. But it, it's a circle or a new economic cycle that I was talking about because with this campaign and that resources that will be capped will be generating new employments that people need desperately in this moment in Costa Rica. So how? By the viveros in the hands of women and by planting and maintenance will be paid for this uh, new the creation of new jobs. So it's, it's creating to celebrate our 200 years of the public, noticing and being able to give the opportunity to build, to reconnect to nature by planting and taking care. So it's how you involve everyone, the kids that will be able, my, my son is one year old. Mm -hmm. So when we plan our group, our family uh, trees, my kid will be able in 50 years to look these mature trees that we probably just uh, plant together. And I probably will not be here. <laughs> so, well, I hope so, but I, I, I don't think so. So it, it's how you can build this uh, transformed culture 
but getting everyone together, getting the, the attachment, this emotional attached to nature is just to, to get back to, 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 what we, to, to what we are. We are nature. So it's reconnecting of, of the nature that we are. So it's just an example. And Costa Rica Mal Natura is more the, the, the political scale, how you can build together in the mainstreaming of biodiversity and create new economic cycles and do the, the new fiscal green uh, matrix of our country. Because if we are a country that are aiming to be decarbonized by 2050, that means that our uh, fiscal matrix have to change. Our environmental payment services, the, the, the principal income is the gas uh, tax, for example. So we have to create and that Costa Rica Mal Natura is the umbrella of how we can create a new incentives and obviously avoid the uh, perverse incentive in our economy. So that is how we are moving on. And they will have uh, platforms, intersectoral platforms, intergenerational uh, platforms, and just opening our eyes of, of studying our gaps, gender gaps, we are not able to have actions and programs to build on, on closing these gaps. So that's how we are moving in different levels and with different examples of how we are engaging everyone on this. Absolutely, now inclusivity is the key of the question. So I want to, I want to um, make sure that we cover one of the issues that are, is important to us, this dynamic between climate and nature. Um, and um, um, Pamela, You've been talking about nature-based solutions. We know that 30% of the climate crisis is, is resolved by nature. How do we make sure, and, and Marisol unfortunately is not here, and I also had to say it, um, some minutes ago, Inger had technical problems and wasn't able to reconnect, so she's sending her apologies. Um, we're at this stage where we have to really think carefully about how do we reset the planet, and immediately you start seeing all this bombardment of notes about Clean energy, we're going to do green energy and, and energy and renewable energy and everything is going to be energy and climate, but we are forgetting nature. Um, are we, how do we bring that back? I mean, I see these two examples in Costa Rica, New Zealand, uh, but Kevin, tell us more. I mean, you come from a country where um, the impact of climate change is being felt already. Um, how, how do we make sure that nature continues to be at the heart, doesn't get it, it's seen as this twin crisis, not, not nature as a second layer um, after climate. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if our how will be the right how for, for everybody else, but what Forrest and Bird has focused on is uh, ensuring that, um, that everybody in our country understands that the impacts of climate change are not only on human beings, they're not only about sea level rise or impacts on the economy or uh, those those types of things, but also um, severe impacts on nature and natural systems. And then talking about um, human human interaction with the ecosystems that we are embedded in. So so actually seeing a, a whole system. Um, being impacted by climate change. So impacts on nature on the one side. Um, on the other, uh, talking about the, the ability to adopt nature-based solutions. And the most obvious of those is uh, reforestation. Um, and we're, we're now working with farmers, for example, um, and as, along, with, along with government to, to reforest. Um, big areas of 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 their farms that actually were never particularly productive for farming, um, and of course that's that's restorative of um, of the environment and natural systems, as well as also being a, a huge carbon sink. Um, and on the other side, working working on emissions again, largely with 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 farmers and and moving to regenerative agriculture. As, as a means of, of reducing emissions there. 
So, so we're, we're, we're trying to build nature into the climate conversation that we're having at every turn. And increasingly, we're being successful in doing so. Um, there's still, uh, st still a lot of preoccupation with, um, with, uh, with, uh, with, I guess, industrial, industrial sources. That's not particularly a a our problem in New Zealand. So half of our emissions come from agriculture. Um, so, so those are the things that we're doing, trying to, trying to ensure that nature is included in, in the conversation at every turn, and also ensuring that the solutions that we adopt as a country to climate, climate change and the climate crisis are not solutions that sacrifice nature. So for example, we are already at more than 80% renewable energy. Um, in order to get to 100%, uh, we, need to, we need to adopt um, generation methods that, that also have a lot of energy storage in them. Uh, one of those possibilities is pumped hydro. And for pumped hydro, you need to uh, actually put a great big reservoir somewhere um, and, uh, and a, a dam or some, some other large, uh, large hard infrastructure. Uh, and the solutions tend to be ones that sacrifice nature. Um, and so we're, we're about to engage in that conversation saying, surely we can find a win-win solution here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I want us to close thinking about uh, the UN General Assembly and the 75th, uh, 75th session uh, that is coming up and the UN Summit on Biodiversity and get from each of you guys uh, your thoughts about how these plays an absolutely critical role in providing political direction and building the momentum that we really need to make sure that we're pushing for this green recovery that puts nature at the heart, that sees the climate and biodiversity crisis as one uh, that really helps us follow the leadership of your countries, uh, but that also helps us elevate the right for healthy environment. Uh, David, perhaps we can start with you. How do you see the 75th uh, UNGA as a perfect opportunity and a springboard? Well, the, here's, here's how it looks. I mean, the, the goal that you have set at BirdLife International of amending the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to include the right to a healthy environment, a healthy planet, that's fantastic. It's super bold, it's ambitious. But we have to recognize that in over 70 years, the Universal Declaration has never once been amended. So that I think we have to consider a long-term goal and we need short-term action. And so the, the straightest path forward at this point is to secure resolutions from the Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly within the next year, because of the urgency of this problem, within the next year, recognizing the right to a healthy environment, which is exactly what happened a decade ago in terms of the rights to water and sanitation. And Pamela mentioned how that's had an influence in Costa Rica in terms of changing the constitution. Recognizing the right to a healthy environment in a UN resolution at the General Assembly would serve as a catalyst for all of those good things I spoke about earlier. Stronger laws, quicker actions, greater public participation, and most importantly, accountability. Because if we look back, you know, we look back at 2002, we set biodiversity targets for 2010. In 2010, we didn't meet any of those targets. We set Aichi biodiversity targets. Now it's 2020, we didn't meet any of those targets. So we can't keep doing the same thing, just setting targets and assuming we'll meet them. Recognizing a right to a healthy planet is a game changer that enables the people like bird life and all of the youth of the world to hold governments accountable and make sure they do what nature needs to be restored and to be a healthy planet. And my God, this planet is so beautiful. Let's take care of it. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. And I'm just going to throw another figure that my friend Carlos Manuel Rodriguez always reminds us of. Uh, you probably don't know these, or maybe you have heard, but we are investing 0.05% of the global GDP annually on nature. That's our planet. That's our home. That's how little we're investing. So that's what we need to change. That's crazy. That's it is crazy. crazy. Absolutely. Um, Pamela. How do you see the UNGA and, uh, and, and the STEM Biodiversity Summit as a game changer? Can we make it happen? Yeah, well, first, as Costa Rica, we are strongest um, supporters on the initiative that just David mentioned. We need resolution of this recognition as a global scale. Um, it will help to uh, improve the, the effective way how countries 
are accomplished, the different goals <laughs> that we haven't been able to accomplish. And the moment is now. So there's not another opportunity. We have four crises right now. Climate, biodiversity, health, and economic crisis. If we don't understand that we have not only the opportunity, but it's a mandate responsibility for future generation and for us that we are living in this moment. There's not another moment. So we need action, but we need it now. So this type of, of resolutions at the, at, the, at the scale, I think that is the way we have to go to increase the transformative change that we are urged to happen. That's one. And then uh, we have the opportunity right now yeah, as, as a globe um, to set the, the new framework for the 2020 and to um, translate this transformative change in actions and in a plan and with a compromise to mobilize the resources to make it happen. And for that, we need not only governments, we need all the sectors to be included and to be participating in the implementation of these uh, actions. So the 30% of terrestrial and marine uh, ecosystem protection must be there. And with a compromise of mobilizing the resources that is needed to be able to accomplish now, not in 30 years, we're talking about 10 years. At the same time, we are just beginning the, the restoration decade. So we have to be ambitious. But for being able to be ambitious, we need that um, national governments increase their national budgets in nature and promote new incentive, economic incentives to make this happen. But bilateral uh, cooperation or multilateral cooperation needs to do also more effort to move more than that 10% that, that is there. And we need to have this new social arrangement where from that 500 billion uh, dollars that are invest in extractive actions, just as agriculture, mining, gas, we need to change that and to close the gap that we need to invest in biodiversity for the safe of all. So um, I think that that's the key message. We have the opportunity now, probably we will gonna have in 10 years. So let's take action together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pamela. And Kevin, your words of wisdom to close this. Oh, it's a hefty responsibility. Um, I, I, I mean, I, look, I, I just echo what, what David and Pamela have said about the importance of this opportunity. Um, the, we have not only a once in a generation, this is a once in a century um, opportunity to actually m make this change. Um, I think about the existing human rights framework uh, in relation to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Our human rights framework is really dealing with the upper levels of the pyramid, but the base level of the pyramid, um, safe air, safe water, safe food for, for people to live, those are about uh, life on earth um, and the right to have and live in a safe environment. And that most basic level of human need is not yet reflected in our human rights uh, framework. So the the case for BirdLife's campaign, I think, is strong. I take David's point, um, and that's going to be a, a, a longer-term goal, but we need to take whatever advance we can at this point. And I guess that needs, and I, and I think possibly it's going to be children's voices and youth voices that are going to be the most effective to actually speak to that international community, to speak to our uh, global governance structures and arrangements from the heart and say we must do this and we must do it now. Um, life on earth depends on us. Great, fabulous. 
Well, I cannot thank you enough for being an extraordinary panel. I, um, I cannot, um, it, it's hard to summarize all of the fantastic um, information and ideas. We are hearing clearly action now, new framework, uh, a new social arrangement, more inclusivity, the youth speaking their voice and being able to tell us and leading all of that with a new right for a healthy planet. Um, I just want to thank everybody who has participated. Thanks so much for all your questions. The webinar is being recorded, so we will make it available to you all. And we'll try to get to your questions. Just know that this is the second of our webinars. We will have one with private sector leaders on the 30th of July, so please stay tuned. And then we want to have one with the youth uh, in August. Uh, so we will be publicizing that in our website and our social media channels. Uh, stay tuned, and I cannot thank enough to all of our fantastic panelists, uh, David, Pamela, Kevin, uh, Inger, uh, and Marisol. You have been an extraordinary group of people to talk about these fantastic dreams that we have for our, uh, as you said, Kevin, one in, 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 in a, probably in the century um, uh, opportunity to really change the model. Uh, from Birdlife, a huge thanks to all of you. Stay safe and stay well, um, and uh, let's make it happen. We are all on this together. Thank you.